Hey everybody, it's Jim from Sprague Wood Turning. Welcome to my channel. This week is my wife's idea. I'm gonna I'm gonna give her credit for this. She said to me, you know, you've got a bunch of bowls out in the drying shed that are substandard, or maybe third standard, or maybe even firewood standard. So why don't you go out and get one of your roughed out bowls and basically make an exploded bowl video. So that's what this is gonna be. I know that a lot of wood turners have this type of inventory in their stock, so uh, I really like working with the substandard pieces of wood and then turning them, of course, into uh, hopefully future family heirlooms. All right, so first thing we gotta do is find a bowl that's suitable for the mold that I'm gonna be using. So uh, let's head out to the drying shed and do that. Yes, that should do just fine. So for those of you who have not seen the inside of my drying shed, this is it, this is it right here. Uh, when I was in full production and doing shows and on the road, uh, every shelf in here would be stacked with bowls ready to go, ready to go on the lathe. Everything you see in here is dry except for this stuff on the floor. And we, um, we actually rough that out this past summer but it'll be rotated through the fridge kiln soon lots of pepper mill blanks which i absolutely despise doing but i have a good supply when i need them and uh you know lots of casting material burls and you know there's just all kinds of odds and sods stuff in here that that's great to throw into uh castings if you need them and of course, these are my natural edge cutting boards. Uh, there's a video or two on my channel involving these, and they're all ready to go. They're all dry except for these. These are the ones that were roughed out earlier this year. It's maple. Unfortunately, some of them have split, some walnut ones. But uh, anyway, I know that a lot of times I talk about the drying shed, I talk about my clean room, and this is the drying shed and it's a 12 by 16 structure that is not heated and uh, just natural ventilation all along the eaves and of course on the ends up there. But uh, anyway, this is the drying shed and I thought I would show it again because some people have been asking about it and here it is. So the first thing we got to do is trim all of the anchor seal off this and trim this piece up. You'll notice when I mounted this in the chuck that I gave it a really good smack a few times to make sure that it's going to be held securely. Yes, the tenon is oblonged, but it's not oblonged to the point where it's not safe to turn. I know that there was a question about that, I think it was last week. So, you know, I'll put these in the chuck, tighten them down. And if there's if it's held securely, then I'll proceed. But if it's sketchy, then I'll pitch it between centers, clean up the tenon, and then mount the chalk.
Thanks to those who watched the polka dot themed giveaway last week, the 105,000 subscriber giveaway. A little disappointed in its performance. A lot of people actually didn't like it, which really kind of surprised me because I, I really love that piece. But it just goes to show you that as human beings, we certainly don't like all the same. But regardless, thanks for those who did tune in. And I'll link that video at the end of this one so that if you missed it, you can see it. So I need to cut out these this bad area. And that's why I'm putting pencil marks down. <laughs> and I really had no plan as far as cutting this up. And some might even say that'll be obvious. <laughs> but I really didn't. I did know that I wanted to number these pieces because trying to reassemble them, then it could have been an issue. So that's why I'm marking uh, the pieces. So it'd be easier to figure that out afterwards. Uh, the one error that I did do, I'm going to slice this again. And I didn't really mark uh, the second row where it started in the bowl. But, you know, it's not really that big of a thing to figure out because once you can line up two of the pieces, yeah, there's where I'm going to cut and do the second cut. But once you can line up the pieces, once you get two of the same, then it's easy to figure out. That bandsaw blade that I'm using has three teeth per inch and it's actually a wood turner's bandsaw blade. I get it from R&D bandsaw blades here in, uh, in Ontario. There is a link in the description if you want to get blades like that. But is there a wood turner woodworker blade and it's got a wide kerf on it. The problem is it leaves behind a pretty rough cut. So it's important to clean that all up because if you don't you'll see that in the final casting. And along with that, I'm going to grind down the tenon that was on the bottom of this because uh, I need these pieces to sit right down inside of this plastic bowl that we're going to glue these to. And it was important to get rid of that tenon in order to do that. All right, so as the glue gun warms up, um, I'm going to place these pieces in here. I should have mentioned that I don't like puzzles, so this is maybe not a good piece for me. But uh, anyway, uh, let's try and figure this out. Struggled with the layout a little bit on this. And one of the issues that you're going to have when you go from a smaller bowl like this, when you're gluing it into, into a larger bowl, is that the sides aren't all going to hit the perimeter of the bowl. One thing that I did forget to do was mark the second row and where it should start in here. See, this is why I don't like puzzles. And the other thing, as far as layout is concerned, probably the easiest way to do this would have been to glue the very top of the bowl to the very top of the plastic bowl. But I needed a little reservoir for the resin to sit there. So that's why I didn't do it that way. Well, there you go. And one of the main reasons why I wanted to put this in here is because I'm not sure about the spacing. <clears throat> so I think what I'm going to do, I don't know, bring them up, but just try and space them evenly, but I don't know, we're going to see how that goes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's going to be a bigger bowl. The other issue that I was having here was I was a little worried that as I'm gluing these pieces in, if I don't get the spacing correct, on the other end there's going to be either a huge gap or there's not going to be enough room to get the last piece in. So that's why I, I, you'll see me actually take some off because I'm not happy with the spacing or it's in too deep. Uh, so that's why you'll see me kind of hold these pieces up and, and two or three of them at a time and try and figure out exactly, okay, this is going to work or it's not going to work and uh, work on my spacing. And the inspiration for this, I, I don't even know what it's called. I'm sure somebody that's listening does, but they, they'll take, um, say like, I don't know, say like the skeleton of a rat, 
and it's kind of it kind of in an exploded view it's not all attached that's kind of where the inspiration <laughs> comes from this I, I just can't remember for the life of me i can't remember what that type of thing is so anyway if you know let me know in the comments down below but uh, anyway that and the fact that you can get rid of all of the ugliness in your bowl and then reconstruct it in this bowl form is 100% the inspiration for this. And um, I think it'd be really cool if you can work in other pieces from other bowls, like from black walnut or butter that or maple, you name it. The possibilities are endless, even resin pieces. Well, there it is. Um, the hardest part about uh, doing this is trying not to get burnt by the hot milk glue. <laughs> it's, those pieces are really kind of slippery and oh, I don't know how many times I've come close to burning myself. Um, just going to go through and pick off any little bits of stringy glue and then we'll uh, get to the next part of this. That should work. This week we're going to be using Artcast from Designer Epoxy. It's the perfect epoxy for this because we'll be able to move forward with the project tomorrow. And along with that we're going to be using Rainbow Blue. We haven't used that in a while and I really like the look of this Rainbow Blue. It'll give us a stark contrast between the cherry wood and I think that it's the perfect tinted resin to really make that cherry and of course the epoxy pop. I like using contrasting colors and rainbow blue with this cherry is perfect. Well, okay, this is our first one. This is, what have I got here? 70 milliliters. This I'm assuming is going to take at least two. Hopefully no more than that. Yeah, probably should have used deep cast for this. Oh well, I'll bring you back when I've got the next batch mixed up. All right, here's another 700 milliliters, and that's 24 ounces for those who like the standard conversion. All right, I never noticed that this was actually floating. So, we'll get Dwayne, because he's heavier. Because of course he's the rock. There. That is almost the perfect amount. All right, I will throw this in the pressure pot and we will see you guys tomorrow. If I don't drop it. Oh yeah. So for those who have not seen my clean room, this is it. It's actually not clean. <laughs> uh, those are my two pressure pots. There's one underneath here. And um, whenever I'm talking about the clean room, this is the clean room. I'm bringing stuff in here so the finishes to cure and uh, for the resin to cure as well. So this is also a little update. I bought the sea container here the other day. Uh, it is a 20 foot white sea container and if you're asking why I got white I figured that it will reflect more sun than having a black one or a darker one. Uh, I learned that lesson from Afghanistan when I was there twice. <laughs> so um, I definitely wanted either a tan one or a white one. This one came available. It's new. It's got a couple little dents in it. So the company took about 700 bucks off the price of it. So I think that's a one little dent there and there's some rub marks on the back, but I think that's good. Now the idea with this, get inside here. On the other end, this is going to be my drying shed. Uh, this is the log lifting rig. There is a, there's a video on my channel. Well, there's a couple of videos showing me using this. I didn't want to leave this behind. Uh, 
got too much time and money invested in this to leave it behind. So what I'm gonna do, uh, so this is, when this seat container is full, then of course they're gonna have to come with a truck and pick it up and slide it. It's like a, a flat deck wrecker. So, you know, we can't put more than five tons in here. And <laughs> this here is probably, if I had to guess, a thousand pounds, I don't know. I don't work in metal, so it's really hard for me to calculate what the weight is. But what I'm gonna do is just screw blocks to the floor to make sure that this can't move around. And I'll actually screw blocks straight over top of these pieces here so that, you know, it can't lift them. So anyway, I'll go around and, and do that kind of different places throughout this rig. And on the other end, I, I, want, um, I want to use this as a drying shed. So what I'll do is take shelv shelves and I'll run them all in a U pattern all the way around this seat container. And I think that that will give us lots of room to put all of the stuff from the from the drying shed in here, because uh, I just can't leave that behind. I have way too much money invested in the material that's in the drying shed. Uh, we just got our patio furniture in here for now for winter time, so it shouldn't be in the way. So as far as packing all the bowls in here is concerned, I could try and put them in boxes, and that certainly would be easier to manipulate, I guess. There are tie points along certain intervals throughout the seat container. But, you know, I was also thinking that I might just actually stack a bunch of bowls in behind, get, say, some 5-H plywood, make a wall across, and work my way out and just kind of fill this whole area in. And then that way I can use that 5-H plywood on the other end to make benches and all that other stuff. But um, still all to be determined yet. And uh, I think that this being white certainly should help reflect the, uh, the heat that it's going to get. So the, and the other, I should mention the other deal with this is, so on the other end, I'm going to try and tuck this underneath the carport that's going to be built on one side of the workshop. So I'll leave probably this door closed, swing this door all the way open and then build like a normal door here so you don't have to deal with a big seat container door every time you want to get into this. Uh, anyway, it's starting to make things real. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway, it's, um, my wife and I are, are really been kind of torn about moving back to New Brunswick or staying here. And anyway, this really kind of made it real. But, Bigger and better things to come. Well, it is the next day. Um, I just took Dwayne off of here. Let's, uh, I, I will say this, and I'm surprised to see this resin on the top. It has dropped off slightly, but uh, I was anticipating that it was gonna drop off more than that, so that's good. But one-to-one -one resins are gonna cure up faster. Um, so it gives less of an opportunity for the epoxy to soak into the wood. So, uh, but of course, in a 24 hour period, you were able to move forward with your project. At least you can with the Pro Series and our cast. With all these glued in pieces, this should be uh, challenging to get out. <laughs> or not. <laughs> well. It's kind of funny, I was like, all these glued in pieces is gonna be a nightmare to get out. Well, there it is. Don't see any bubbles. Everything looks all awesome. While I've got lots of thickness here to work with, I've still got the cold jaws mounted on my chuck from the last time I used it. So I'll just put this on that and then we'll get a glue block on the bottom. So that was a little surprising because keep in mind, every time you cut a piece of wood, you expose end grain. So I really did anticipate this eating more resin than this. And in a way it's kind of disappointing because I could have glued the pieces right up near the very top of that bowl and made this a larger bowl. But hey, I wish to err on the side of caution. Anyway, there's our glue block going on. 
once that's all cured up, usually 10-15 minutes, I'll move it outboard and start trimming up. And to do that, we're going to use the Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems. This is the number three. And uh, nothing real challenging about turning this piece, really. Uh, the resin, the resin performed as expected. There was no thermal cracking. Didn't really see any bubbles in the work as well. When I first put it on the lathe, I also looked at all those glue spots and like, hmm, hopefully we don't have a lot of resin standing because I would have to trim away a fair bit of material in order to get rid of any resin staining where the glue was covering the wood and would have prevented the uh, the resin from penetrating the, uh, the casting. So that was good. There wasn't really any issues at all. And um, yeah, I'm very happy with this piece. Can't wait to do different variations as well. Maybe on a much larger scale. So the goal at this stage is to strip away the excess resin, get rid of any ghosting that we've got, because I really don't want to see any ghosting on this piece. And when I'm referring to the ghosting, I'm referring to where the resin is sitting on top of the wood. I want to get rid of that. I just want these uh, nice hard lines where the rainbow blue is sitting and not really any resin or epoxy sitting on the surface of the wood. And there you can see where the glue has been stripped off the surface and there's some ghosting that I'm referring to and I was really happy to see that the <laughs> the resin staining wasn't going to be an issue in this piece and you know it really would only be an issue where the end grain is on this bowl and not on the side grain of this bowl of course because side grain is not going to absorb the epoxy as much as the end grain of this bowl would have so that was a real bonus and I'm, I'm glad that that worked out because uh, at the time I never really thought about it but I probably should have possibly putting something like you know spray lacquer or a sanding sealer on the surface of this piece prior to cutting it up may have worked in our favor as well but it really wasn't an issue so i'm glad that i didn't take that step but if you're working on a piece that has a lot of end grain in it you may consider doing that before cutting it up Here's a real nice zoomed in view and kind of shows the cutter in action. If you watch the shaft of the Hercules, you'll see it kind of moving just slightly left and right. And, and I'm twisting it slightly just to find that sweet spot where it wants to cut nicely. Uh, anyway, love this tool. Highly recommend getting one if you're going to do any resin work. That is 100% for sure. Been getting a few questions about negative rake scrapers and I'll try to cover that here. So the Hercules by definition is not a negative rake scraper but if you look at the front of the tool it's tipped forward. So that means that the cutter is tipped forward as well. Uh, you certainly can get catches with the Hercules and you've seen them here but if the tool handle is just lifted slightly above uh, horizontal you know, it, it really puts the cutter in a negative rake position and you never really, there's not really much of a chance of getting a catch. Uh, negative rake scrapers uh, essentially have two bevels that come to a point. 
So there's not really anything for the wood to catch on, and you know, that's that's what makes them really user friendly. Uh, the only problem that I really have with traditional negative rake scrapers is you can't use them like a gouge. So I I learned a gouge long long ago, and this is the great thing that I like about the Hercules that you treat it essentially like a gouge, and that's why it's an easy transition to go from the gouge to the Hercules. So that where those two bevels come to a point there's got to be a burr there if there's no burr then it's not really going to cut very effectively and of course a skew laid on its side is essentially a negative rake scraper and you know that they're great for beginners to <laughs> maybe get over their 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 fear of what what a bad catch will entail <laughs> but uh the only thing that you really got to there's there's two things with card by tools especially especially the ones here from hunter tool systems is that yes you have to buy the cutters that go on the ends of these tools and they're cupped and so because they're cupped they seem to stay sharper a lot longer than say normal carbide cutters and the thing is if you're you got to look at it this way as well so yes you have to buy cutters for the hercules but if you're using a traditional gouge to cut back all this epoxy well, you're going to be sharpening, you know, the heck out of your out of your gouges, and you're going to burn through them quickly as well. So when I was in full production prior to coming to YouTube, and I wasn't doing any resin turning, I would essentially use two Ellsworth gouges a year with all the sharpening that I would do. So that adds up in a hurry too. So still got a little bit of ghosting to do on the very top of this, and then we'll be able to move to the inside. Yeah, right there. So, you know, that, that's kind of my, my thoughts on negative rake scrapers and what the Hercules is. And, you know, <laughs> the vast majority of the Hunter tools are shaped like this. And that's one of the things that I find makes them really effective. Anyway, there is a link in the description for American customers and Canadian customers. And uh, anyway, go down there and check them out and let me know what you think. There's one of those zoomed out views again. People really seem to like these views. Uh, actually, my workshop looks pretty clean too there from that view, which is not the norm. Anyway, I would sooner be turning than cleaning. <laughs> that's, the, that's kind of my, my thought process when it comes to how clean uh, your workshop is. Yeah, you don't want tripping hazards or anything like that, but uh, anytime I've seen somebody's workshop that's, that's really clean, I just think to myself, well, they can't be making anything. It's just purely for show. <laughs> so anyways, once I've got all of the excess epoxy stripped off of this and get, you know, basically rid of all the ghosting, then uh, I'll, you know, kind of, I'll measure my wall thickness and then go from there. Uh, for this piece, I'm shooting for, say, 3 8 to a half inch in thickness, somewhere around there. Yeah, the never-ending resin blowing off tools and yourself it's uh <laughs> and the camera don't forget the camera uh anyway the bottom of that top bowl was indented a bit so there's a fair bit of epoxy sitting there so we got to get rid of that and then um pretty soon we'll be able to move on to sanding everybody's favorite to get back to the sea container i think that you know i think we got a pretty good deal on it and on the other end i certainly would like to spray foam it well we'll have to see how much that costs because even oh, I, there's lots of vents in it but I think that it's still going to be quite hot in the summertime and you definitely don't want you want your drying shed to be actually cool away from the sun and with lots of ventilation uh, I don't have any heat in my drying shed you definitely don't want that in my current drying shed basically sits in the shade in the hot part of the day which is pretty much ideal and I'm not going to have that luxury on the other end. But I'd like to hear from people that do have seed containers and use them either for storage or, you know, like I'm going to be using it 
uh, for. That way, going forward, I'll be able to effectively set it up. I'm really hoping that we're going to be able to set the front of the seat container under the opening where the lean-to is on the side of my workshop, my future workshop. But um, my wife said, ah, there may not be enough height there, and she might be right. But I hope I can stick it underneath the opening. That way it's kind of sheltered from the weather. These are the three and a half inch dimple discs from sandpaper.ca. And I have used sandpaper.ca for a very long time. I, If I had to guess, I would say that it's been a good solid 15 years or longer. So, you know, when I asked them if they'd be willing to sponsor my channel, I was really, really uh, happy about that. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, for the price, these are the best discs on the market. Yes, there's more expensive discs that maybe will last longer, but for the price, these discs are, as far as I'm concerned, the best ones that I've ever used, and I've used a bunch of them. Anyway, this piece is going to be sanded from 60 to 800, and then we'll be able to move on to finish. Well, alrighty, this is the first coat of Waterlux gloss. You may have noticed that I did not buff this piece uh, because of these small little resin lines. I didn't really see the need to buff this piece, but you certainly could have. Well, I must admit that this is even cooler than I anticipated. I wasn't so sure, but uh, we'll call Cherry the the queen of North American hardwoods. I do like the fact that we can see some pearl between these larger gaps. Anyway, let me know down in the comments what you think and I know that they're random and uh, that's really what I was going for. I like it. See you tomorrow for the second coat. Now we're going to use the Triple E buffing compound from the Be All buffing system. And of course I use this between coats to knock down the finish and take out any lumps and bumps that may be present prior to the next coat of finish going on. We'll use some denatured alcohol and get our next coat. Good morning, this is the second coat of Waterlux Gloss. Well, there's the second coat. Certainly has uh, covered nicely. Don't know, I we'll see some stuff there. It's probably gonna need a third coat. Do you like this concept? I'm thinking about this, but cutting up two bowls, say a black walnut and a cherry, and then combining them together, mixing them up. Pretty cool, I think. All right, if there's a third coat, I will do the same as this one. Other than that, we'll see you when we're doing the foot. All right, now it's time to free this piece from the waste block and I'm using the 3 16 inch party tool from Crown. Uh, I was a little too far away with it from, with the uh, tool rest I was using, so switched to my shorter one. And then uh, once I got it down far enough, cut it off from the handsaw. And that's typically what I leave about an inch to an inch and a half. Uh, any more than that, you're risking it coming off the lathe and that really depends on the size if it's a much larger bowl i don't know if i'll go down that th that thin maybe two inches and then cut it off with the saw so just going to clean up the bottom here with the hercules on my vacuum chuck setup and unfortunately my vacuum um, chucking system is on the outboard end of my lathe so i don't have the luxury of using my tail stock to line pieces up uh, envious of those who can do that, but I can't because I do my setups on the outboard end. Anyway, the bottom was sanded from 120 to 500. 
Anyway, thanks for watching the video this week. Let's have a last little talk about this week's project and let me know in the comments what you think. Well, what do you think about this week's project? I think it's a cool idea. Really digging that blue with, with this cherry. The queen of North American hardwoods. Here is the very bottom. I do get, I do have one coat of finish on the very bottom. It will still need at least another one. Uh, size on this piece, I'll put the metric conversion up on the screen, is eight and three quarters of an inch across, three and a half inches tall, and I think it's anywhere from three eighths to a half inch in thickness, maybe a little thicker down near the base. Uh, I really like it. Uh, Ideally, the signature would be all the way around. I didn't want to sign on the resin because you're hardly going to see it. And I thought about doing the engraving, but it doesn't really typically look good when you're engraving resin and wood. So that's why I didn't do it. But ideally, it would be going in a circle. But uh, I just, I like this the way it is. So anyway, don't forget to leave a comment down below to be entered into the next giveaway at 110,000, and that's when we'll do the epoxy draw as well. Um, this will look really cool if you had two bowls, a black walnut and a cherry or maple, and then cut and, you know, you could even do three, really, and just kind of intermix all the pieces. Uh, you'd have to be careful on your cuts. You'd have to try and lay it out so the cuts are very similar. But uh, hey, you never know, you might see it here on this channel too. Anyway, this is for sale. Send me an email to spraguewoodturning at gmail.com and I will disclose the price then in case it's a gift. I uh, actually really, really like this. Don't forget to put designer epoxy down in the comments below to be entered into the three gallon kit at 110,000 when we get there. And along with that, designer epoxy still has the promotion going on my channel. We will get five free color bags, Free shipping within continental USA and Canada and 10% off your order when you use code INLAYGYM at checkout. Today, epoxyproductsusa.com is going to be a distributor for designer epoxy in Florida, in the state of Florida. Yeah, the state of Florida. And um, so anyway, if you need right now within florida that's where you're going to get your epoxy products from designer epoxy so please go to epoxyproductsusa.com and you can get all of the the designer epoxy line there and you can use my code to get your your uh your discount as well uh, i guess that's it so the last thing that i really want to talk about is remembrance day tomorrow well november the 11th will be remembrance day here in canada and of course a lot of other places in the world so please take the time to remember the fallen and those who are still feeling the effects of war today i would really appreciate that and i know that a lot of other veterans will as well uh <laughs> next week we're going to be working with a color that most people are terrified to work with including myself uh, so far it looks good but we'll it's still in the working stage but we'll have to see how that goes so please come back every friday at 9 a.m eastern that's when my videos go live well all right that's it take care stay safe don't forget the bell please share my videos with your friends that is the largest way for me to build my presence here on youtube and we'll see you next friday